You would think because you're innocent that things couldn't go wrong, but you'd be mistaken. Hey everybody, welcome back to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today I'm actually drinking Truly, you know, trying to switch things up, and we're going to go over the case of Sheila Bryan. On August 18th, 1996, Sheila Bryan lived in a small town of Omega, Georgia, with her husband, Carla's, and their two daughters, Kari and Carla. Also, her 82-year-old mother, Frida Weeks, was staying with them. Sheila and her mom, Frida, they decided that they were going to go on a drive. They were going to drive the countryside and then also stop at her father's grave. They really enjoyed doing that. They would reminisce and it was a bonding moment for them. They were very close. On the way there, Sheila said she became distracted and she lost control of the car. She drove a 1987 Ford Mercury Cougar and it ended up going off the road. And before she knew it, she was at the bottom of a 30 foot embankment. This thing was steep. I watched her interview on Forensic Files and she said that it felt like a jolt. When she went to turn the car off, she could not turn it off. The car would not turn off. She couldn't get the keys out. It was really weird. She didn't really know what to do. So she looked over and she was telling her mom, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. She's running around the car to try to get her mother out and the door's locked. So Sheila decided that she was going to run up the steep embankment to the road. So she could try to flag somebody driving. There was a man driving in that direction and he saw her waving her hands and shouting. So he pulled over and when he got out to assist her to find out what in the hell was going on, that's when smoke started to come out of the front of the car. The man ran for a nearby house. That way they were able to call 911. Sounds funny, right? But cell phones weren't really popular until the 2000s. She said in her interview that all she could really remember doing was throwing up. She was in shock and couldn't believe what was going on right in front of her eyes. When the police arrived, they found Freda in the passenger seat, but she was deceased. Sheila told them what happened, that she was driving. She became distracted. Next thing she knew, she was over. As the police were looking over the scene, they started to question if she was telling the truth. There were some irregularities. The first thing they noticed was that the gas tank on the car, not only was it open, but the cap was missing. Where did it go? Another thing that they found puzzling was underneath Sheila's car, it was undisturbed. The undercarriage was still pristine. There was no scrapes. There was no scratches. There weren't parts anywhere. You're thinking if you're going down a hill at, I'm not sure what speed, but you'd think you'd be picking up all kinds of stuff under there. There was nothing. There's also no skid marks on the road. You couldn't tell that anything was going fast. It literally looked like somebody like pushed the car down that hill. They were very confused by this. And when they looked inside the car, they thought for sure something was not right here. The passenger side of the car was destroyed. The driver's side had just little bits of patterns here and there. It appeared to look like the car door was open on the driver's side and that somebody was pouring something because you can see it travel out the door like it followed somebody. The carpet on the driver's side had droplets of something. They just felt like something wasn't right. But they didn't do an autopsy on Freda. Why would you not do an autopsy? But they did, however, do a toxicology test. That also turned out to be not what they were expecting. Freda had no carbon monoxide in her lungs. She had no soot. There were no signs that she was even in a burning car. So she was already dead. You know, I'm... Not brilliant or anything, but I do believe at this point, at least, this is when I would have done an autopsy. But no, 
now they bring in outside experts to test the samples and test the car to find out what really happened here. Try to reanalyze it, make sure if there were accelerants used, look for anything that can help piece this puzzle together. What happened here? The only things they found in the car was a wallet and a claw hammer. They weren't sure if the hammer was the murder weapon, so now they decide that they're going to exhume her and do an autopsy. The engine and the exhaust pipes showed little fire damage. On the driver's side, they said it looked like the door had been opened with the accelerant that has used for the burn pattern going out the door. When they tested the debris found in the car and all the evidence from the car, everything came back negative. And the autopsy showed that Frida's cause of death was cardiac standstill. Well, you know, all this, it it takes time. Toxicology alone is two months, usually, give or take. And they had to get everything tested. Everything had to come back. Sheila's husband really didn't do her any favors. Uh, I don't know how he thought it was going to come across, but he pretty much told the police detectives that they needed to hurry up and close the case so they could get the $100,000 payout from their liability car insurance. So needless to say, that kind of rubbed detectives wrong. And Sheila was indicted for arson and murder on December 18th of 1997. Prosecutor said that she had deliberately set the car on fire to collect on the car's auto policy. State arson investigators testified that the fire began on the floorboard in front of the driver's seat and spread to the passenger seat that the blaze was intentionally set by someone using a flammable liquid. At trial, prosecutors pointed out to the jury what they believed were the burn patterns. A defense expert testified that there were no burn patterns left by ignitable liquids and that the fire was actually caused by an electrical failure. When Sheila took the stand in her own defense, her story changed a bit. This time, she said that the car, it stopped at the top of the embankment, but it was teetering and that she had her seatbelt on, so when she opened the door to try to get out, it pulled her back and it hit her arm, and that is when the car rolled down the embankment. She also said that her mother was non-responsive, when originally she said her mother was fine, but this time she said, yes, I was telling her, I'll be right there, I'll be right there, but she didn't say anything back. It was the burn pattern evidence that had sealed her fate. On September 4th, 1998, Sheila at age 44 was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for murder and an additional 20 years for the arson. This divided up their whole community. A lot of people thought that she was innocent and a lot of people believed the forensic evidence and there was like, no. I mean, now when I say community, I do say this lightly because this is literally like a one-stop light town. So it's one of those where everybody's in your business. So the people who really did believe in her innocence, they went as far as creating a support group to help raise money so they could hire their own independent fire investigator. A friend of hers saw a 48 hours episode and it showed this guy who specialized in doing these things. So when they saved up the money, that's who she hired. His name is Dr. Gerald Hurst, PhD, and he is a fire analyst. While he was doing some research, he found that in 1996, Ford had the largest recall by a single automaker in history. This recall affected the ignition switch for 3.8 million cars. You know how many cars that is? That's a fucking lot. Although her year wasn't in that span, he just had a feeling that it was still the same piece. So when he took the switch out of her 1987 Cougar and compared it to the 1988, it was an exact match. It was the same model number. Something else he found interesting looking over her conviction was prosecutions, they hired Ralph Newell. He was their star witness, their fire expert. Turns out he worked for Ford. 
He was a consultant to Ford, and he was head of a task force set up to investigate its ignition switches. Because of his work, that's what caused Ford to do the recall. And he didn't say a word, not a damn word, while that woman was on stand for her life, that there could have been a problem with the ignition switch. She said on that stand that she couldn't remove the keys after the accident. She couldn't get the keys out and she couldn't turn off the car. That was a clear sign of exactly what happened and he overlooked it. On June 14th, 1999, the Supreme Court of Georgia unanimously overturned the verdict, ruling that the evidence about the insurance policy on the car was improperly admitted because there was no evidence to connect a crime. Turns out that wasn't even covered by their insurance. They didn't make a penny. They released her. She was ecstatic. Finally, somebody was listening to her. She got a part-time job. She was delivering meals to the elderly, spending time with her family again. But Georgia prosecution decided that they, they're still not done with her. In January of 2000, Sheila went on trial again in a neighboring town this time due to all the publicity. This trial pretty much was just going to be a battle of the experts. Prosecutors also produced a new motive for the trial, since they weren't going to say that it was greed. This time they said that Sheila was just sick and tired of taking care of her mother. She wouldn't do it anymore. The defense had many, many witnesses come up to tell the jury how close of a relationship Sheila and Freda had. They were very close. No one could see Sheila ever wanting to hurt her mother. Gerald Hurst testified that the fire appeared to have been started by a faulty ignition switch and that what prosecution experts said were poor patterns, they were actually a result of the burning of plastic that melted during this intense blaze. He said that the prosecution experts relied on outdated and disproven arson theories. So he's saying when the beginning of the car started on fire, the inside started melting. That's where all these little trickles were. So it was coming from her car melting. He also challenged the state's argument that the burn pattern proved that her door was open when the fire began. The prosecution maintained that the pattern showed that Brian had started the fire then closed the door. But expert Hearst told the jury that the pattern could have resulted even with the door closed because that door seal is not airtight. Melted plastic flowed underneath the door. So it didn't matter if the door was shut or not. It was coming out the door regardless. It's hot. It's coming. It's like lava. After four days of trial, on January 28th, 2000, the jury deliberated for three hours and then found her not guilty. Sheila said that she always tried to be a strong person because her mother was a strong person. I still can't believe that guy didn't say anything. Like, they brought up what your specialty was after you did a study on it. <laughs> and crickets? Like... You just worked on that. You're going to send a woman to prison. Thank God she was only in there for 10 months because a lot of people who are in there like that, it's a long time. They wait years before they can even get an appeal. So she was very lucky. Maybe her mom was by her side the whole time. I'm still curious about that gas cap. First of all, why was your tank open? Second of all, where is your cap? That is a little strange to me. If that was my husband, I think I would have popped him. <laughs> like, oh my God. But I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Do you believe that justice was served and she got out and that's exactly what it meant to be? Or do you think she got away with murder? Don't forget while you're listening to like, follow, subscribe, leave a five-star rating. Come find me on Instagram. I added a new addition to the merch. It's the I Talk Crime All The Time t-shirt. Super cute. Just got mine. Is there a crime that you would like to talk about? Do you know of a crime that you would like me to talk about? Go ahead, drop me a message. You can do that on the Instagram page or on crimeovercocktails.com at the official website or crimeovercocktails at gmail.com.
Can't wait for the next episode? You might not have to. Becoming a Patreon at just $1 a month, you can get access to early episodes and much more are coming. Word of mouth is always great too, so keep showing that love and we'll talk crime another time. Bye.